स्वयं प्रभा डिजिटल इंडिया एजुकेटेड इंडिया Hello and welcome back to NPTEL, the National Program on Technology Enhanced Learning. We are in uh, now in um, the fourth lecture, um, sorry, in lecture five of uh, module one. Module one, as you know, is introductory in nature, and um, these lectures are being brought to you by. Um, uh, a joint venture by the Indian Institutes of Technology and the Indian Institute of Science. These lectures are um, for the students of, uh, you know, in different engineering colleges and IITs, and uh, where humanities and social sciences courses are offered as elective courses. And our course is, as you know, entitled Cultural Studies. And uh, in um, these three or four lectures, we are looking at the contribution of science and what science has, what light science has to show or to throw on culture. And um, in the lecture before this, we looked at evolutionary psychology and we saw that evolutionary psychology through its five principles as given to us by Lida Cosmides and, to be, uh, um, and John Tooby. Um, can tell us a lot about why we have the kind of minds that we have and what our minds are actually uh, for and how our minds have developed. We had looked at uh, you know, how evolutionary psychology is a reverse engineering, has a reverse engineering methodology and we saw uh, uh, in the main that um, our minds are actually uh, made to solve adaptive problems in the past, right? Uh, however, in, uh, in today's lecture, we are looking at the origins of the modern mind. We are not looking at the prehistoric mind, at the mind as it evolved, uh, but we are looking at uh, really our target here is the modern mind, and we are going to look through, uh, you know, through it to uh, at the modern mind and its origins through uh, three transitional uh, phases as given to us by the scholar Merlin Donald. But as always, we are uh, going to, before that, look at some of the points we discussed in the last lecture. So, as we go through the recap, you will recall that evolutionary psychology is really not a branch of psychology, but it is an approach to psychology, where knowledge and principles from evolutionary biology um, are used Okay, to do research on the structure of the human mind. Next, we also saw that our minds, our information processing, our, 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 our mind is comprised of information processing, um, sets of information processing uh, units or circuits and uh, the job is to solve certain kinds of problems. Okay, these problems we call uh, adaptive information processing problems and there are many problems all right, but uh, there are four core problems that we may zoom in to uh, and we can see that these problems are those that were there in our evolutionary history and interestingly they, interestingly they are also with us today. So, those problems we saw in the last lecture were those of face recognition, threat interpretation, language and navigation. Then a quick recap of the five principles of evolutionary psychology um, as were given to us by Lida Kuzmaides and John Tooby in their primer on evolutionary psychology. The first went like this, the brain is a physical system, it functions as a computer, its circuits are designed to generate behavior that is appropriate to our, your environmental circumstances. We also saw the second principle as um, given to us by Tubian Cosmides as, and I quote, our neural circuits 
were designed by natural selection to solve problems that our ancestors faced during our species evolutionary history, which is to acknowledge the fact that our circuits were um, designed by a principle, by a force if you will, which is uh, the one that was so elegantly formulated by Charles Darwin in the 19th century, which is the force of natural selection. And these circuits were designed to solve not current day problems, but problems that they faced by our ancestors in our evolutionary history. Next, the third principle of evolutionary psychology we saw had to do with consciousness and we saw consciousness as you know um, both awareness uh, also as our subjective experience. We also saw uh, that consciousness may be considered as our wakefulness. Okay? Anyhow, no matter what um, you know definition uh, we adopt of consciousness, the point that was made by evolutionary psychology was this that consciousness is just the tip of the iceberg. Most of what goes on in your mind is hidden from you, I am so sorry, is hidden from you. As a result, your conscious experience can mislead you into thinking that uh, your circuit is very simple, for instance. Okay? So, we saw with the example of how, you know, what goes, um, you know, that we saw that there are a number of processes that uh, go into uh, the very simple, seemingly simple process or act of recognizing one's own mother. There are inputs from definitely the visual system, from memory, um, from various other systems. And the point was to, to uh, you know, to argue that all these, uh, you know, uh, the, all these uh, processes that go into that act of recognizing one's mother or anyone for that matter are um, thousands in number are hundreds in number and these are the point is these are hidden from us and I had said that we can very well speculate that the reason why these are hidden from us is because uh, we do not really need to know them in order to survive and there would have been an information overload okay, if we were to really be aware or conscious of all the processes that give us the final results or what to be and Cosmides had called. Uh, the high level conclusions or perceptions. Next, the fourth principle of evolutionary psychology we saw was this, different neural circuits are specialized for solving different adaptive problems and uh, we had discussed this, we had said that um, like as in engineering uh, where you know uh, an all purpose machine is no good, for instance a hammer cannot do the job of a saw. Okay. Um, like in uh, the human body for instance, okay, there are various organs devoted to different kinds of specialization. For instance, uh, the liver is devo devoted uh, to, um, uh, to detoxification, uh, then the lungs for respiration, the heart for pumping blood, etc. Uh, following evolutionary biology, uh, we also in evolutionary psychology, uh, we argue that and our neural circuits are specialized for solving different problems. Okay, the, uh, there may be overlaps. Scientists may have found overlaps. Okay, but the point is, there definitely are circuits that are specialized for doing different jobs. Then we saw the last principle was very again eloquently put as our modern skulls house a Stone Age mind, and we saw that it may, it means this that. Uh, even in our modern forms, okay, even as we have a modern form or we live in modern times, uh, the mind that we have is one that was sculpted, uh, as the metaphor used by Tubi and Cosmides, this was like uh, wind, you know, uh, sculpting a piece of rock, for instance, okay, for thousands of years. And um, well, why not? Because it seems that 99% of our species evolutionary history right, was uh, spent in hunter gatherer societies right? and the uh, you know uh, all uh, the rest of it you know the you know um, the, uh, the beginning of agriculture for instance the computer age the industrial revolution before it right all these are as to, as the authors say simply like the uh, you know 
uh, like uh, the blink of an eye when compared to the enormous amount of time okay spent they say it is a thousand times more um, than um, uh, than any time spent in any stage of evolution okay so 99% of our species evolutionary history was spent in the hunter gatherer stage and we have minds uh, that are essentially okay even if they do uh, produce or perform very sophisticated tasks like mathematics for instance like high literature very good literature for instance like music for instance okay uh, and very complicated complex tasks um, it still is a fact that uh, you know many in fact argue that these are perhaps byproducts of the original uh, you know of, of the original tasks right that our brains were sort of sculpted for right so our modern skulls house a stone age mind and the fact is that you know the, the those core uh, adaptive problems like face recognition like navigation okay remember uh, like threat interpretation and also things like the raising of children gathering of food etc all these are things that have not and perhaps well we may speculate are not going to leave us it's, they are going to be with us in uh, as far as survival and reproduction in the darwinian paradigm uh, are accepted as uh, the goals so to speak okay towards which our brains were uh, designed fine so the topic of discussion now is as we saw the modern mind and it i think it's fitting that we uh, this is uh, the next uh, lecture in our series the modern mind and its origins and uh, the key source text in this lecture um, is by merlin donald origins uh, his work the origins of the modern mind uh, let me add a caveat here see it is not um, it is not that uh, this is the only narrative so to speak of the development or the or and the origin and the development of the modern mind okay there may be different uh, you know there may be different findings as uh, work goes on or there may have been others who uh, who delineate or describe uh, a different set of transitional phases okay one reason why i brought uh, this text here is that it is quite an accepted um, uh, text now uh, and uh, if we have to see um, because it is a linear narrative okay if we have it has three phases if we have to see or look at uh, the story of the origin of the modern mind as a narrative then we cannot have too many overlapping and contradictory um, texts right so uh, i begin with the caveat that perhaps some of the findings will change but it is enough for us to know because we are not exactly focusing on um, uh, you know on on, on uh, prehistory and anthropology here we are trying to look at a text that is going to give us some knowledge about how culture was formed right so let's see how this narrative has been woven together by merlin donald okay the central argument in donald's text is this and that is why we need since we are doing cultural studies we need this text human beings have evolved a completely novel cognitive strategy compared to other animals okay and this cognitive strategy is our brain culture symbiosis okay this is also known as coevolution right we have a whole theory of coevolution and this strategy is one that was developed you know singularly by the humans you know by homo sapiens by the human species so we have a brain culture symbiosis meaning we have um, you know the physical feeding into the cultural the cultural feeding into the physical and it's a coevolution and that is why we need to know this narrative then donald says as a consequence the human brain cannot realize its design potential unless it is immersed in a distributed communication network that is a culture during its development this is very this is this is immensely important okay look at this he calls culture a distributed communication network now because 
Okay, now I will unpack um, unpack his words and I'm going to uh, speak uh, about the point that he wants to make here. It is that because the evolution was a symbiotic one, okay, the evolution was not simply one to do with the brain and only physical pressures for un or environmental pressures, uh, topographical pressures. The point being made is um, the human brain today, right? It cannot realize that is even it cannot uh, sort of manifest and achieve its true potential, right? Without being immersed in culture. It, it is only because we have uh, sort of developed with culture and brain, with the relationship of brain and culture, with the physical and the cultural, right? We um, cannot achieve our, you know, full potential unless we are in a culture. Okay, and th that is why it is important for us, you know, before we go on in other modules to look at more modern forms of culture, to look at modern cultural practices, to lo we look at the key concepts, the sites of cultural studies, right? It is important for us to ask this question, we have a mind that has developed culture. How was this mind, okay, how was culture developed through a mind and how did this very mind develop? And one of the things that we saw was of course in evolutionary psychology and how really our essential propensities are for our core, um, you know, core evolutionary problems like face recognition, etc. Here, uh, Donald gives us another point, and that is he points to the fact that the that brain that the brain developed with culture and culture developed along with brain development. That is why we need to see the origin of the modern mind. Then he says the human brain is quite literally, specifically this is important, specifically adapted for functioning in a complex complex symbolic culture. This is very important. Okay. We have something called symbolic thought. What is symbolic thought? And you will uh, see in when we discuss in towards the end of this module, when we talk about structuralism um, as a school of thought, as a theory, we will see that um, a capacity for symbolic thought, that is the capacity for uh, you know cognizing the world, retaining uh, things about the world in our memory using symbols is a major breakthrough. Right, is a is not only a, first, not only a major breakthrough in our evolutionary history. It is also one that uh, eventually allowed us to have mathematics. Eventually allowed us to have language. Okay, um, later on you will come to know how uh, you know language is based on the fact that words are arbitrary. Right, words. Um, uh, uh, and uh, there is no one 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 to one correspondence between a word and the object that it refers to. For instance, this pen that uh, I am holding here, uh, there is nothing, uh, there is no relation between the word pen and this object that I am holding. Is there something pen so pen like about this, you know, um, this object that calls out to us to call it a pen? Okay, it is, it is. Uh, there are different words in different languages for a pen and that is proof of the fact that the relation between the pen and the word pen, the object pen and the word pen is one that is arbitrary. This kind of arbitrariness would not have been possible had we not developed symbolic thought. So, symbolic thought is immensely important and again symbols and signs and signifying practices as we shall see over the next few lectures okay, are really the foundational topics in cultural studies. So, let us read again the human brain is quite literally specifically adapted for functioning in a complex symbolic culture. So, as I said symbolic thought is uh, one that is um, uh, if not thoroughly completely peculiar to us uh, as a species. Uh, it is still something that has allowed us to have very a very complex uh, culture, very cul complex forms of knowledge um, beginning with the, the alphabet and the number systems. Okay, fine. So, this, uh, this uh, work by, um, by Merlin Donnell about the story of the origin of the modern mind and it being you know um, and culture being a very important part of it, okay, hinges itself on three major transformations right and he declares this in the beginning really and he says that the, this entire development uh, uh, through a brain 
cultural symbiosis has to be seen or studied under three major transformations throughout uh, you know prehistory and history. The first transition and I shall explain all of these um, through uh, his work. First transition, the first transition is called uh, is something that entailed a kind of skill known as mimetic skill and auto cueing. These are the two features of the first phase, okay, mimetic skill and auto cueing. The second transition involved in the main or at least its major feature was lexical invention and the third transition was the externalization of memory. Okay, so, what are the first uh, what are the three transitions a that the first transition in involved two important features mimetic skill and auto cueing, second transition lexical invention and third uh, here memory is externalized and uh, this entire essay will be devoted to these three transformations. Okay. And then um, the effect of the transformations um, which I again point to towards the end, uh, the effects were these that there were three new uh, sorry or uh, new uniquely human systems of memory representation, this is important. Okay. Compared to other species, we had we developed a unique, a new novel unique system of how you know our memory was going to be represented. And another effect was there were three interwoven layers, right? Of these are three interwoven layers of human culture, each supported by its corresponding set of representation. Okay, look at this. There, there was a different way, okay, different systems that developed through brain culture symbiosis of me memory representation, and there were interwoven layers of human culture where we find each of these stages had their own representative systems or systems of representation, right? So let's see how this happens. Okay. Then selection pressures as Merlin Dolan says and I am reading from his text, selection pressures at the stage of human evolution were ultimately expressed and tested on the socio-cultural level. This is why we need to look at the story that I have talked about, the story of the origin of the modern mind. Okay? Because in evolution uh, the changes were physical all right, okay? but as he says, you know, where is the manifestation of this? The manifestation, where is the evidence from it? How do we glean the evidence? The evidence is gleaned from the socio-cultural level and they were tested that these selection pressures and these evolutionary adaptations that they are uh, established, that they are there to stay and that they are beneficial for the species were finally, as he said, tested uh, on the level of the socio-cultural. Then he says the evolution, this is important, okay. the evolutionary scenario can be described as a series of cultural adaptations. Now, this is really a new way of, uh, you know, of, of describing things, right? a new way of formulating things. For instance, uh, we always, uh, whenever we talk about evolution, whenever we talk about Darwinian theory, we think that these are to uh, do with only evolution or changes at the physical level. Okay. Now, we have a scholar who is, who, is, who is telling us that these are also at the same time cultural adaption. So, the evolutionary scenario can be described as a series of cultural adaptations, even though individual cognition was really where the main event was taking place. Okay. So, that is why we, we are going to look at these changes also as cultural changes not even if they are happening in the brain and in the body. Okay. These are not simply to be read only as or considered only as biological physical changes. Okay. Then uh, the essay says the most important evolutionary steps were concentrated into a few transition periods when the process of change is greatly accelerated and there are uh, to begin with, okay, uh, there are to begin with um, one very important point here, which is the increase in the size of the brain, and I would like to spend some time talking about this here. Okay, uh, there is something called the East Side Story, which you have heard of. 
the east side story as you know holds that we the human species okay the human race originated in africa okay after uh, ge uh, you know um, uh, a geological catastrophe which we call um, the great rift valley which separated you know um, uh, the eastern part of africa from the western part as there was a formation of a valley and it threw up a uh, you know um, uh, it threw up uh, you know a set of uh, mountains which separated the eastern side of africa from the western side and the uh, our origins are go back to the eastern side which was arid which was dry and uh, when we came down from trees and when we developed uh, bipedalism or walking on two feet okay and um, eventually we took to meat eating okay uh, we took to meat eating which led to a protein rich diet okay which had uh, enormous implications as far as the development of the brain was concerned right meat eating led to a protein rich diet and it led to an increase in the size of the brain right so it is not that there were there was only one increase in the size of the brain scientists tell us that there were several perhaps increases in the size of the brain but one major breakthrough came about where, you know with bipedalism with hunting uh, for food okay with an increase in the size of the human brain following a protein rich diet a second import, very important physiology of uh, uh, physical anatomical change sorry anatomical change was the descent of the larynx okay uh, the larynx you will find um, in uh, in the apes okay uh, in our in our cousins are uh, slightly higher up right whereas our, our um our larynx of homo sapiens are down here right so if you look at this here slide right so if this okay so there was a descent of the larynx okay which created as linguists and you know that uh, people who study anatomy and linguistics would say that there was a peculiar geometry being formed here right which we call the inverted l this is or here the inverted l the inverted l gave a peculiar ge geometry to um, uh, you know uh, to uh, to us and uh, it enabled you know uh, it enabled a repertoire of vowel sounds right which you know this descent of the larynx therefore was immensely important for what for the beginning of language right with the repertoire of sounds was more uh, than that available to our eight cousins right so what are the two points here big to begin with increase in the size of the brain and descent of the larynx both you have to understand according to uh, donald and other scholars both had uh, you know immense implications for the development of culture okay language is a part of culture okay our hunting skills are you know our communication skills um, are part you know a symbolic sort are part are part or what go into the building of culture right these are traced to the increase in the size of the brain and the descent of the larynx and you have to remember that this uh, you know this happened together what we saw a while ago a couple of slides ago uh, where the merlin donald calls it a brain culture symbiosis right so a rapid increase in brain size uh, happened in the first case okay the in the first case in initial stage the increase was not everywhere the increase was concentrated in three areas now let's look at these according to donald these three areas are the association cortex the hippocampus and the cerebellum it is so interesting if you look at this you know the association cortex as it increases in size it enables um, it is something that is responsible for complex perception okay so an increase in the association complex in the speculated okay gave us the possibility or it it created the possibility for complex perception 
Now, hippocampus, an increase in the, you know, in the brain in the site of the hippocampus, which is responsible for memory, enabled us to also, also it increased our capacity for memory. And finally, cerebellum increase in, in this site also gave us balance and posture. Now, if you look at the story here very carefully, balance and posture are required for or skill in balance and posture are required for bipedalism or on standing on uh, standing on two feet. Before this, um, uh, you know, we were not standing on two feet, right? It was a development in in evolution in our evolutionary history. Before this, what we had was uh, we were walking on all fours, and like you, as you see in chimpanzees, etc., they do something called knuckle walking, right? So they walk on their knuckles. Now, as uh, there was pressure given, given uh, you know, um, an arid um, a situation in the eastern part of uh, Africa. Given a situation where they had to be, they had to hunt for food. They, they took to meat eating as part of the diet, right? Given uh, such a feature, uh, it was necessary that there should be bipedalism. And with the with bipedalism, what happened was there was a there was a freeing of the hand because you are no longer knuckle walking, there is a freeing of the hands and with the freeing of the hands as uh, scholars tell us, uh, there was what we call the beginning of the, the gradual you know beginning of the opposable thumb. That is the thumb is opposable as compared to uh, you know uh, our ape cousins is opposable to a great degree from the other four fingers. Now, uh, let me elaborate on this, what hap because it has immense implications for culture, right? What happens when slowly the thumb is opposed to the four fingers is that you get two kinds of grip, right? Extremely important for our first tool, for our first technology. This grip is A, the power grip, okay, to be able to hold and implement, right? Um, the other grip is the precision grip to be able to do things to make things to make implements with a certain degree of precision. Now, if you notice carefully uh, without an opposable thumb it is not possible to have either a power grip or, or a precision grip. So, this opposable thumb is what gave us the first culture. So, you see the relationship between physical change and cultural change right and then we began to hunt in groups we began you know um, uh, to communicate more among ourselves we developed language with language we developed words with words you need more memory to store you know and also to store uh, other kinds of hunting strategies right where you did hunt uh, yesterday for instance okay and for complex perceptions when one needed to survive then one had to change and for that we need a brain that had to accommodate all these changes and the increase in brain size came about as scholars say with you know with the eating of so this uh, eating of meat. So, there is so many forces really so interesting the story is so beautiful so many changes that came about together right in a brain what Donald calls a brain culture symbiosis. So, the cultural evidence now if you if you ask me you know or ask the scholars how do you know how do you know that this happened right. So, the cultural evidence for is that uh, we do find sophisticated tool or uh, stone tools okay in places um, where uh, uh, you know um, archaeologists or paleontologists study of paleontology is a study of fossils um, uh, have been to or do their work and make excavations there, there is evidence of long distance hunting strategies and of course of migration out of Africa. So, this is the cultural evidence that we have. Remember what Donald had said, Merlin Donald says that eventually all these changes that happen in adaptation to the body, okay, these changes were ultimately what he calls realized or manifested uh, or become evident. Uh, at the cultural level and that is why I remember he calls this a series of evolu evolution, a series of cultural adaptations. This certainly is another way, a novel way of looking at the story of evolution. So, the second major transition as we saw 
uh, led uh, was by another large brain expansion and at the same time the descent of the larynx this is something we have already discussed the descent of the larynx is important why because it led to two things one is it led to a high speed vocal um, communication system and the large lexicon remember the lexical invention is an important part in stage 2 and so there was uh, uh, what is a lexicon as you know lexicon is a dictionary is a, a collection of words right so there was there were new inventions and there were you know uh, there were additions to the lexicon uh, or to the set of uh, set of words and terms and symbols that were there in our ancestors um, uh, mind stored in our ancestors brains and also concurrently there was a high speed vocal communication system that grew along you know along with this right. Now, we will uh, look at what happened to uh, you know to apes, why they did not uh, you know uh, why is it that apes did not achieve this level. A very important point here is apes are our cousins all right in our in the evolutionary story but apes have something a memory system uh, which Don Donald, Donald calls um, an episodic memory system okay this will lead us to an important change in par in the first transformation uh, apes have a system memory system which is episodic in nature that is they do not have easy recall without environmental cues right as we, uh, Donald says here they are even brilliant even perceivers right but they have episodic memory and poor very poor episodic recall as they cannot self trigger their memories this is very important they cannot they need environmental cues okay so in case you are wondering why apes did not develop as we do and they have a different evolutionary uh, trajectory after we split from uh, our common ancestor uh, remember we did not evolve from apes this is very important for us to remem remember we evolved um, you know into a common ancestor and then you know there was a bifurcation and therefore apes cannot you know they cannot express knowledge even gestures or minds to communicate even the simplest of in the, uh, intention they may they need several rehearsals you know there is hundreds of rehearsals it seems for uh, to be able uh, you know to uh, uh, to be able to do something without a cue. So, uh, the first transition therefore involves two things mimesis and voluntary retrieval, retrievability. Voluntary retrieval, retrievability sorry is something we saw that apes do not have. So, you would we develop something called auto cueing that is cueing without the need for any uh, any cues that is auto self right. So, uh, we develop a voluntary retrievability because of selection pressures and also mimesis. Mimesis you know is a Greek word the mimetic skill comes from mimesis the Greek word meaning imitation. So, these are the two things that we have and let us read from what uh, Donald has to say. Donald according to Donald two fundamentally new cognitive features develop a supramodal motor modeling capacity called mimesis which created representations that had the critical property of voluntary retrievability in the this is the story first stage in the story of the development. Now, therefore, we see that the first the main logic for the first transition is based on several premises that is the revolution in the modeling system right. They used hominids were, uh, were able to use the whole body as a representational device ok to mime or to imitate things. Um, in using the entire body remember we do not have language at that stage right. So, the entire body was used to represent things and there was a self triggered rehearsal loop meaning there was an auto cueing system which was self that is self triggered which did not need any cues uh, ok. So, that uh, you know if you are in um, uh, if you want to if you want to remember an event that had happened elsewhere you do not need to again go to that place to trigger the memories you can trigger your memories at will. Then okay. Homo at this stage the Homo erectus had when we did not have language and not yet in the second stage right. Homo erectus our species had something called proto language. Now, proto language um, 
what is, a, is what he calls donald calls a limited degree of linguistic capacity okay it's not full fledged language proto language would mean uh, you know two word sentences for instance and we uh, compare it to the utterances of uh, you know a child a two year old child for instance uh, uh, depending on the child's development uh, how you know you know the you know the how how the child tries to communicate with his parents or others using just two words right where there is no sense of syntax really no I mean, no sense of grammar right so this linguistic capacity this very limited linguistic capacity was something that was developed uh, by uh, the time the first st uh, second stage would begin and this was important and it helped in tool making and social coordination now there is going to be the descent of the larynx which did what if you remember it gave you know a, a great push to a phonological system system of producing sounds okay through what for donald calls a high speed phonological system and second there was lexical invention the addition of more and more words into the repertoire so therefore auto cueing as we saw re required no environmental cueing and is something that uh, you know uh, distinguishes us as a species so the socio cultural implications of mimetic action that is remember mimetic action is the, the using of the entire body as a representational device what happened was there there was a dramatic increase right uh, donald calls it a dramatic increase in the variability of facial vocal and whole body expressions as well as in the range of potential scenarios between individuals second there was a quasi symbolic communication to create a very simple shared semantic environment in donald's words now the second phase has a two more features and we have seen this capacity for lexical invention and a high speed phonological apparatus this is you know why this is important for culture particularly it is important for uh, you know it is the rudiment of you know uh, rudimentary system which goes into the a the creation of myths and b to the creation of you know ultimately to the creation of literature for instance okay of stories right it is important for us from the cultural studies point of view because it gave us a narrative thought right so as donald says here the natural collective product of language was narrative thought essentially storytelling which evolved for spe specific social purposes and served essentially similar purposes in modern society right to be uh, you know simple narrative to be able to um to kind of articulate things in a linear sort of way this happened and then that happened and then the following happened to add causality to it this happened then that happened and because of this because of that a third thing happened do you follow okay so this kind of linking things into narrative thought be is because you had and there's an extension of what he calls the lexical skill and to the labeling of relationships the arbitrary la labeling labeling of relationships between words and this collective product of you know language um uh, you know a uh, uh, language a growth of language of words of the you know uh, uh, of the phonological system was a very important capacity we had apart from the symbolic capacity and this symbolic thought and this capacity is narrative thought which give us gave us our first myths then the socio cultural ramifications now of this of uh, in the second phase was that it increased the number and complexity of available words and grammars okay obviously there's going to be a syntax now if you need a, a, a linear and a causal uh, system of representing events then you would obviously need a grammar right you need a syntax in which to to uh, arrange uh, those thoughts and there has to be uh, an increase in even in the number right in the number of words and as donald says it altered human culture by introducing a new level of shared representation remember the rep, the, the level of shared representation in the first phase was a level uh, that was that played out in the in you know it played out in the body right um it was it was where the body was 
used as a representational device, remember mimetic skill. But now what happens was we have an, an entirely new level of shared representation uh, which had enormous implications for the development of culture. It was not bodily, right, but it was spoken, okay, it was language based. So, this is why we call it a new stage and I think Donald rightly calls it, there is no denying the fact that the descent of the larynx and an, along with another growth, uh, you know, uh, increase in the size of the brain was an important second transformational phase. Next, we come to transition number three, the third important transition in the development of culture along with selection pressures and this is very interesting. This is external memory storage and retrieval and a new working memory architecture. Um, what is meant by external memory, right? In this scheme, external memory, uh, it is quite obvious, it is, it is what I have in front of me, okay? Uh, I am not um, giving this lecture or I am not, uh, uh, you know, I am not talking to you simply from my own memory, right? I do not need this if I am going to talk to you uh, base my recollection from my external, uh, sorry, internal memory, the memory that is there inside my brain, right. So, the third stage is important in this, it is a relatively new stage. It is that our, we no longer rely only on our internal memory system to, uh, to, to store our knowledge, to store the procedures of how things may be done. Right? Uh, we have external storage in the sense we have books, right. So, if I go out shopping, I have, uh, I carry a list with me. That list is not, you know, in my internal memory, it is on a piece of paper which is the external memory, right. Uh, so, external memory storage and retrieval, this, uh, you know, the CDs where we, you know, the hard disk uh, where we, you know, the, the external disk or the computer disk where we keep our things, anywhere where we store our knowledge and uh, you know and not in you know so that there is no, no the, you know knowledge grows so fast that our internal memory cannot uh, cannot uh, uh, definitely obviously cannot store the normal human brain cannot store uh, so much uh, material in its internal memory. So, in the third phase as Donald says in the development of the origin of the human modern human mind and, uh, and, and the development and change in culture is that we began to store things you know outside of our internal memory into what we call our external memory system and therefore, there is a new memory architecture why because they say there are two fields now one is your internal memory okay, and one is the external memory which is an extended field for your uh, memory uh, working archi architecture of the memory. I will not go into this a lot because the second thing this new working memory structure is something uh, a person from psychology would be able to explain to you better. Nevertheless, the important point is in the third transition or the, the third transition is marked by uh, the, uh, the development and growth of um, various kinds of devices for storing for external storage of memory. So, now Donald says that what happens with this external storage of memory is that there is a wide range of new possibilities, right? Possibilities to do with not simply storage, okay, of data, right, uh, but also the way data is now processed. Remember, they, he said that there is a new working, you know, there is a new um, uh, working, uh, mem working memory architecture, right, and the, hence there are new possibilities or ways of processing, not only of processing, but also the way we retrieve things. Since we are not retrieving directly from our own internal memory, we are retrieving things, data from external memory and yet our brains are also working along with these external memory devices. There are, there is a definitely a different uh, way of a wholly new system with new possibilities, okay, of of uh, looking at looking of storing knowledge or even these things add to the way new knowledge is produced right uh, so uh, i'll end by looking at this uh, slide for instance 
Before was there before the coming in of external memory. Thought here was dependent on biological working memory, but after external memory, the situation has changed with the increased use of external symbolic storage. All these points are given to us by uh, by Donald. Then long term store. Uh, were accessible by means of limited associative strategies in the stage before external memory, okay, available to biological mem memory. But after the external memory systems, there was, a, as we said, a larger architecture within which the, the individual mind works. This has changed, right? And the structure of internal memory is now reflected in the uh, external environment. So there is a larger field, as it were, to work with, and. Uh, before external memory, finally, there was a need for oral mnemonics, and there was a need for uh, you know for us to adopt different strategies, right? Different shortcuts because we are retaining things in our own memory, right? So there was also the need for specialized people like shamans, for instance, um, uh, who uh, who were used, you know, who had the task of preserving uh, memory material. Not everyone. The work was divided in such a way that only some people were engaged in the task of it of you know a task of uh, storing memory well and who knows this may have been the first kind of you know division of labor of mental labor and physical labor right some were uh, assigned the task or you know of of retaining things in their memory but after external memory what happened was an external memory field uh, developed okay an external memory field which served as a real working memory for many mental operations and there is also an external long term store. The long term store is not just in now in no longer only inside our brains, there is also a huge external uh, long term store. You, you can also look at uh, this from the point of view of the internet for instance, not just storage devices like uh, the hard disk for instance, the entire uh, in, in the the world of data, a world of data is available to you through the internet. You it's just as as it says, um, you know, at the click of a mouse, you can access. You know, you know, it is because knowledge has is growing so fast, and there is so much to be retained that it is impossible. It is impossible for us to store everything in a limited memory system, right? And that is why. We needed we needed the written word. We needed uh, you know those uh, new storage devices, and this has also changed even physically, right? The way our minds work. Why? As Donald says, it is because we have a new environment here, which where there is a symbiosis of the external and the internal memory system. Therefore, external memory system a amplified the number and variety of representations available to us and increase the degree to which our minds share representations and rely on external devices for the process of thought itself because this is so it, it is so important for us to understand that even uh, you know for the, the process of thought or the processing of thought perhaps has changed because of the availability of these external storage devices fine so quickly let's look at a few points here um, if you get a question like what is the human brain specifically adapted for according to Donald, it is that the brain is adopted, uh, adapted for functioning in a complex symbolic culture, okay, it's important, complex symbolic culture. Then how did the evolutionary scenario proceed as far as humans are concerned? Now we, the answer is this, we have to look at the evolutionary scenario as a series not simply of physical adaptations or changes, but as cultural adaptations. Why? Because the selection pressures that were there, uh, even for you know, uh, even for the anatomy or and physiology of uh, the species, were ultimately expressed and were also tested. And am I and I might add here that also the evidence comes from the socio-cultural level, right? Then what were the three major transformations in the story of the origin of the modern mind? The three major this is Im immensely important. Three major transformations. We have to be very careful when we so that we don't mix these. First transition had mimetic skill, which where the body was whole body was used for represent representation, 
and it also had auto queuing which we know was self uh, had a self triggered rehearsal loop you do not need any environmental cues unlike apes okay the memory is not episodic they we uh, sort of developed okay um, a system called auto queuing where we could recall memories at will the second stage we find that the most important thing was lexical invention uh, following among other things the descent of the larynx anatomically speaking uh, which gave us a peculiar vowel triangle right or, um, in the shape of an inverted l which allowed uh, which gave us a give us more repertoire or larger sorry a larger repertoire of vowel sounds through which we could create new words and develop our lexicon it also included uh, uh, the, uh, the you know high speed phonological system third is as we saw just a while ago the externalization of memory uh, which is a relatively new development okay it is the last stage in the transition of uh, you know uh, of last transitional phase in the development of the modern human mind as compared to the evolutionary mind okay so what we saw in our last lecture okay uh, the last the, the argument in the last lecture for the point of view of culture was that all that we do no matter what cultural arrangements we have the the fact remains that uh, you know ultimately our mind is support you know uh, our minds are geared to solving old problems okay problems faced in our evolutionary past which is 99 percent hunter gatherer society uh, when you look at the time scale right but this uh, Donald's essay or Donald's work Donald's book tells us uh, that there is a difference you know particularly when you come to lexical invention and you come to the externalization of memory uh, we see that all these new things that we are able to do is because uh, these changes have taken place okay there was there is a narrative uh, developmental story if you will okay to this and but at the same time the beauty is it does not do away what uh, evolutionary psychologists have claimed right in the ultimate analysis yes we have these what we may call the deep structures okay the deep structures and our deep propensities okay for face recognition for raising uh, children and you know, for finding mates etc right thank you so much and uh, uh, we shall meet in the next lecture thank you.